uh, we're exploring arachnids, uh, some of the most fascinating uh, groups of animals um, here in the Adirondacks. One that I'm sure uh, many of us have mixed feelings about. I always uh, like to joke around that my least favorite and favorite animals are both arachnids. Uh, but here we go. Let's go ahead and hop to uh, my screen here. I'm going to go ahead and share this screen. And you all should be seeing a wonderful spider hanging um, on Wild Walk. This is a picture I took uh, last year using iNaturalist to try to identify the spider. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a picture of the top portion of the spider, so I didn't identify it completely, uh, though I was able to help me figure out what, what group it could have been in. Uh, so we're talking about Iraq today, and that's far more than spiders. There are so many different organisms uh, that fall into uh, the group of animals known as arachnids, uh, from scorpions to spiders to some extinct species uh, here uh, with uh, sea scorpions and such, uh, to uh, these ones right here, which we'll be talking about a little bit today as well, um, the carids or the, the ticks and the mites. Uh, so today, uh, I'll be talking to you a little bit about uh, deer ticks or black-legged ticks, uh, and we'll be identifying some of them using a microscope. And then we'll send it to Shannon, who will be our field correspondent from Wild Walk, talking about species of spiders that we have right here um, in the Adirondacks and uh, highlighted on, on, on Wild Walk as part of our exhibits. Uh, so many of these may not be familiar with, may not have actually seen, but I thought it was a great example of the diversity of arachnids. And a, a good way to tie into our nature fact for the day, that is there are over 100 thousand known species of arachnids on the planet, uh, ranging from different habitats and different locations and climates around the globe. Uh, so for all of those, or most of those, uh, there are some key characteristics of the arachnid um, body. They tend to have two body parts. They have the cephalothorax, this head portion here, uh, that will be split into two components for something like an insect. Uh, so we have the cephalothorax, and then we have the abdomen, the two body sections. And then when we look at the legs, they're a little bit different than insects as well. Insects known to have six legs, uh, arachnids have eight. And then this first set of legs, uh, labeled here as pedipelps, are used a little bit more for sensing and manipulating uh, than, uh, than the other ones. And so we have, again, eight legs, little pedipelps here that help them move food and, and such around. Uh, they have their chelicerae, uh, which for spiders would be fangs, and other arachnids would be evolved a little bit differently uh, to serve different purposes and helping them to eat. And then for spiders, uh, they have the spinnerets. And actually ticks have spinnerets as well uh, that produce silk uh, to create, for spiders, creating webs and such. Uh, for ticks, allowing them to have some nice sticky little hands uh, to grab on uh, to animals as they pass by. Uh, so I will be focusing on, on ticks, specifically uh, the deer tick, a tick that uh, we have throughout New York State and Northeast and, and, and right here in the Adirondacks. Uh, so ticks have a few different life stages and we tend to really only see the adult life stage and that's usually uh, just about if they're engorged uh, when we're, they're a little bit bigger and they're a little bit easier to see. Uh, so I know this isn't to scale, ticks are not that big, um, but we'll take a look at some uh, real specimens in a second. Uh, once I'm done sharing the presentation here, I'll hop to just me uh, and I'll hold up this, this specimen for you. Uh, so the first life stage for a tick, they hatch from eggs in large groups, and then they are, are larvae. Um, these little larvae uh, would then feed once and molt into the nymph life stage, which is the intermediary. You can look at it as like the, the teenage uh, years for the tick. Um, the nymph will eat again, molt into an adult, uh, which tend to look different if you're a male or female. So the male tend to be just dark all around their body, and the females have the dark section on top here, and then this fleshy section back here is actually what will expand uh, when they're engorged, when they feed, uh, so that they have that, that energy from, or the, the food source from the blood uh, that they can use to reproduce and lay more eggs. So we ended up at the beginning of the process here with more larvae again. Uh, the reason that I'm referring to these as black-legged ticks rather than deer ticks is that um, black-legged ticks tend to feed on, on many different organisms from small mammals and birds all the way up to deer and humans. Uh, so they aren't specific to deer, uh, though that could be a, a food source, especially for the adults. And uh, for identifying uh, black-legged ticks, as their name implies, have black legs. 
Uh, so that's a great way to tell that you're looking at a deer tick as opposed to something like a dog tick or otherwise that, that could also uh, be found uh, throughout the Adirondacks. So here's a little video that I put together uh, using a, a camera set on a microscope. Uh, so this is what we're focused on right now is the nymph. Um, and then this is an adult female of the black-legged tick. And I thought it was just a good idea panning um, up and down so you could see the difference in size of these two. So we have the nymph here. And it'll pan here in a second as I focus in on the, the adult. With the adult female, you can see it as the eight legs representative of arachnids. A little petty pelt like appendages here. And then this is their mouth. Uh, which they would then insert into whatever they're feeding on um, to get that blood meal um, to, to further their life. So let's continue along here. We'll pan from the adult back down to the, the, lar or the, the nymph here. See, it, it also has eight legs, four on either side, and its mouth parts are right here at the front. Cool. Uh, so this one here is a dog tick. It's a little bit different. They tend to be a little bit larger bodied. They still have eight legs. They still have a similar mouth part and a similar way of feeding. Uh, but they tend to have this lighter section on their back that's pretty um, representative of them. And they look a lot like a, a watermelon seed, I suppose, um, with this, this distinct white spot. So before we get to the life cycle, I just wanted to show you a couple examples in the scale of these animals. So it's it's a little bit hard to see from the, the microscopic images, uh, but let's go ahead and take a look here. So this little guy, I'm gonna flip it over so you can read it, it may be backwards. But either way, this little guy right there, that's a nymph. It's very, very small, uh, very, very hard to see. And so it's why we uh, recommend wearing light clothing if you're out hiking and definitely doing a tick check when you're back from hiking because that, gets lost really, really easily on your skin, especially if you have freckles like I do. Uh, so that is the size of a nymph of the deer tick or black-legged tick. And this one here is the size of an adult. So still relatively small, though definitely bigger than, than the nymph. And then this one, again, if we were to put it on my arm, it's still pretty small, definitely good to be aware and looking for them if, if you're out hiking or in, in, um, in grass and such. Uh, ticks cannot jump, uh, but they do, as I said, they have spinnerets on their front legs and they can use those to, to reach out and stick uh, onto to organisms that, pa that pass by. It's called questing behavior. So they'll stand up as high, high as they can go, whether it's grass or a bush, and they'll reach out with their little, little claw, their little hands, and they'll stick to you and that's how they're able to, to get onto you if you were to interact a tick with a tick. So nymph, uh, adult, black-legged tick, and now for comparison with the deer tick, there's a deer tick there, or no, not a deer tick, a dog tick. Uh, so we have the dog tick on the left, a little bit bigger, you can see that white spot on its back, and then the uh, black-legged tick on the right there for me, a little bit smaller. And so, Throughout their life cycle, they only feed three times. Um, they feed once from larvae to nymph, and once from nymph to adult. And then if they're a female, they're feeding one more time to get that energy for, for, for their eggs uh, so they can reproduce and make more ticks. Uh, so if we go from an adult female here to an engorged female, one that's fed, their back, that, the red part that we saw on, on the slides, uh, gets a lot larger and is full of blood that they would then use for their energy uh, throughout the, the rest of their life or the next life stage. So we have an adult one and then an engorged female here. Great. Uh, so let's hop back in to the life cycle of ticks. They have an incredible and somewhat strange life cycle that, that I wanted to share with you all. Uh, so it's this way, it's set up as a spiral. I'll lay it out flat as well if that, that's helpful. Uh, so we're starting as eggs in the spring. So these eggs will hatch in the spring into clouds of larvae. These larvae are clean. They have not fed on anything, so they don't have any of the tick-borne illnesses with them. Um, ticks, while they're associated with Lyme disease, they don't actually create the Lyme disease, that bacteria uh, that, would, that would get other organisms sick. It's typically the small mammals that, that are reservoirs for Lyme, and that when the larvae feed on them, 
they would then pick up Lyme and then hold that throughout the rest of their life, transmitting it to other organisms that they feed on. So spring is when the eggs hatch. Throughout the summer, larvae are out in feeding, typically on small organisms. If they were to feed on you, it's unlikely they would transmit any, any diseases. And they're very, very small, so that's, that's good that uh, they're unlikely to do that. Nymphs are that next stage, slightly larger than the one that we saw the first little slide. Uh, the nymph would then feed throughout the spring and summer of the following year. And this is typically the one that's really hard to find and typically the, the life stage that would most easily transmit uh, uh, Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses uh, to humans. And then the adults will feed typically in the fall so that they can lay eggs. If they don't end up reproducing, um, they can overwinter as adults and feed again in the spring. So you'll see uh, a bump of, of activity from adults in the spring to try to get that one last effort uh, to lay their eggs uh, so that they can perpetuate uh, uh, ticks in the environment. So a nice spiral format to, to their life cycle here. And what does that look when you collect ticks? So these ticks were collected um, by our colleagues over at the Montshire Museum in, in or Montshire Science Center in, uh, in Vermont and are labeled by the month that they were collected. And this graph here illustrates pretty nicely that you're always likely to find ticks, especially if it's warm enough. Here in the Adirondacks, it's a little bit colder throughout the winter, so you're not likely to see them. Though if we did get a warm day, uh, ticks can, can be active throughout winter months. They're very active in the spring in May and June with the highest numbers collected here. Out and about, they're, they're getting that, that meal so that they can be productive, either reproducing or, or molting throughout the summer months. And then one last effort for the adults in the fall, uh, typically around October, are when they are feeding again, uh, either to overwinter or to lay their eggs. Um, so because of this and this, this cycle of tick activity, it's really important, especially if you're, you're loving the nice weather, uh, to be aware and, and to, to do tick checks, whether you're hiking um, in May and June, or again in the fall, probably around Indigenous Peoples Day, out and about on the trails, checking out the fall foliage, to make sure that you are doing tick checks throughout the year. Uh, something that's relatively new to many of us uh, that live here in the Adirondacks, since ticks are, are just arriving, or, or are in a larger abundance uh, now, uh, but many places throughout the Northeast have had ticks for many years, and it's just part of your, your overall behavior. You get ready to go, you wear nice bright clothing or light clothing, have socks that are pulled up, and um, uh, any uh, bug sprays to try to get them to not come onto you. And then at the end of your hike, it's good to, to take a look and make sure that you aren't finding ticks, especially in places like your armpits or places where uh, they would, would crawl to, which are nice and warm. Uh, and this uh, is from the CDC. So the CDC uh, collects data on occurrence of, of Lyme. So this is where people went to the doctor and were, were diagnosed with Lyme and, or at least diagnosed positive for Lyme. And throughout the years from when they started to 2017 and, and beyond, you could just see more and more blue dots. Uh, Massachusetts, if you've, if you've noticed this rectangle here, has reported their, their information a little bit differently. So they haven't figured out a cure to Lyme or there aren't, they haven't eradicated ticks. It's just a different way of reporting data. Uh, so they're pretty much um, pervasive throughout the Northeast at, at this point in the game. You know, it's really, really important. Not necessarily to be scared of ticks, uh, but to be aware that they are there and take uh, precautions because of that. Uh, so with that said, we're going to send it over to Shannon to look at uh, some spiders and to see some ecosystem services that spiders do for us here throughout the Adirondacks and throughout the world. Uh, so she will be hopping on in a second. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and spotlight her video and we're good to go. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Shannon, as Michael just mentioned. I'm an educator here at the Wild Center. And I am currently coming to you from Wild Walk. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar, Wild Walk is one of our outdoor exhibits here at the Wild Center. It's a series of trails and bridges that takes you from ground level up to about 40 feet into an Adirondack forest. Gives you a different perspective on the forest here. And along the way, we have some cool interactives, the most popular being our giant spider's web. So I am currently on the spider web platform, which stands about 25 feet in the air. 
And because we have a giant spider web, of course, we also need to have a giant spider. So this here is Svetlana. That was the name given to her by Wild Center staff. And Svetlana is a giant shamrock spider. And the reason we chose shamrock spider for this web is because they are a member of the orb weaving family. So they weave webs similar to the one that we have here, uh, the interactive web that we have here at the Wild Center. And this spider, of course, is a model and is much, much larger than any normal shamrock spider would be. Svetlana here is about a hundred times the size of a uh, typical shamrock spider. So the females are going to be about three quarters of an inch and the males are even smaller, only about a half and quarter of an inch to a half of an inch. So these spiders are relatively small. Um, and I always like to say that although shamrock spiders are not green, we are very lucky to have them. So they are in the genus Arrhenius, which composes about 650 different species of orb weaving spiders. So that includes common barn spiders, European garden spiders, shamrock spiders. Um, and these guys are actually really helpful for us people. Um, so whenever I see one of these hanging around, around my house, uh, I like to leave it be, thank it, uh, for helping to keep me safe. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But first, let's talk a little bit more about um, their webs, because the webs are the most crucial part to their survival. So shamrock spiders, as an orb weaver, they are actually weaving a brand new web every single day, because that's the main way that they are able to catch both their food and their water. So the web really helps that spider survive. So they're going to collect moisture on that web, whether it's from dew or rain or any other moist, natural moisture in the environment. And then of course, their web's going to be nice and sticky. So they're also going to catch their source of food in that web. And shamrock spiders, they have been known to build their webs up to 25 feet in the air, which is perfect here um, on Wild Walk, but they may also build them as low as 10 feet in the air as well. They have a pretty big range of where they build those webs. But to me, the coolest part about the shamrock spider is every morning they're actually going to eat the silk strands of their old web to recycle that silk through their body. So they are nature's recyclers. They're not going to waste anything. So they're going to eat the, their old web find a location to lay out their brand new web. After about 24 hours or so, most webs will naturally lose their stickiness uh, just due to being exposed to the environment. So wind and rain and environmental conditions will cause that sticky texture on the silk to wear away, which is why it's vital that these spiders uh, spin a new web each and every day. And that's where they focus most of their energy. So what the shamrock spider is going to do, it's going to find some sturdy vegetation. So they do like to hang out in gardens, um, in open forested areas, as well as um, parks. So any, anywhere with really nice sturdy vegetation is their ideal habitat. So they can be found in multiple locations. Um, and the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to cast a nice loose strand and hopefully it catches the wind and forms an anchor point to some vegetation across the way. And spiders are releasing their silk from an area known as the spinneret, which is at the base of their abdomen. So looking here at Svetlana, Michael mentioned a couple of different body parts of spiders earlier in the presentation, but we have her cep uh, cep cep cephalothorax. I couldn't say that word for a minute. Cephalothorax, which is a combination of her head and her thorax. Um, up here in the front. And then that big red bulbous part is her abdomen. And at the base of her abdomen, she has what's known as a spinneret. And the spinneret actually releases different types of silk based on what she's doing with that silk. So silk for wrapping prey is going to be pretty fine. Um, silk for wrapping egg sacs is a little different as well versus the silk used to travel, to build a web. So they can control uh, what type of silk they're producing from that spinneret. And the silk is actually a liquid when it's inside of their body. And as soon as it reacts to the air outside of their bodies, that's when it becomes um, a solid substance, which is pretty cool as well. But to build her web, what she's going to do is she's going to cast a line out. Hopefully it anchors on to vegetation across the way. Sometimes this part takes a couple tries. The wind blows it. Um, so this is probably the hardest part of building that web is finding a good anchor point from point A to point B. As soon as that silk thread catches 
um, she can actually cinch it up and form a bridge. And that's the first kind of structural support of that web is the bridge. So she can then walk across the bridge. When she gets in the center, she's going to drop a line down that forms a V. Then she can sink her body into the V and form a Y. So if you think about a V and then a Y, and that gives her the groundwork to build the frame of her web. So the first thing the spider is going to do is build the frame or the outside of the web. And then they're going to lay their radius strands, which go uh, into the center of that Y. And once those two kind of foundational pieces are laid out, and those parts are actually non-sticky because the spider needs to be able to walk on their own web without getting stuck. And they know where they're laying down sticky thread and where they're laying down more structural support thread. So she's gonna have her radius built and then she's gonna go in and add the detail of the spiral. And the spiral is where she lays down that silky thread for catching her prey. Uh, and if you think you have an idea of what type of prey a shamrock spider is catching, feel free to drop it in the Q&A if you have some ideas of what you think her ideal food would be. But some orb weavers, what they do after they complete their web is they're going to sit right in the middle of their web and wait for their food. Shamrock spiders, they don't do that. Uh, their big red bulbous abdomen would help them stand out and prey may avoid their webs. So what they do instead is they're going to find a little secretive section in some vegetation just uh, alongside their web, but they're going to have something called a signal line from the center of their web to their little hideout uh, that's attached to their one of their legs. And they are very sensitive to vibrations in their web. So as soon as an insect lands in their web, they can feel a, a vibration come down that signal line and they know to go check it out. And again, they are very in tune to the vibrations in their web, so they can actually tell the difference between an insect or food and say something like a leaf or a blade of grass that occasionally will blow into their webs. So they will not react if something like a leaf or a grass blows into their web, but will when an insect does. And they can even tell the difference between an insect that they may want to eat and one that could potentially be dangerous to them. So occasionally there are some insects that may get stuck in a spider's web who can both bite or sting. Uh, so the spider needs to be more cautious when she's going to um, wrap that insect because it could potentially harm the spider during that process. So sometimes they'll avoid those larger insects that pose a more prominent threat. But say um, an insect flies into that, um, that web gets stuck she gets a signal on that signal line. She'll go up to the web and using these parts right here, she's going to inject a mild venom into that prey item, which does two things. Number one, it uh, paralyzes it or immobilizes it. And then number two, it starts to break down that, um, that insect. So what spiders do is they're going to inject it and then they're going to wrap it in a fine wrapping silk. And then they're gonna go back down to their little cubby hole uh, attached to their signal line and they're gonna wait. Because what's going to happen is that prey that's been injected uh, by venom and wrapped in silk is going to start to liquefy. And then the spider, once it's had enough time to liquefy, is going to go back to the web and then suck the juices out of that insect. So they eat a little differently than how we eat. Uh, but shamrock spiders are pretty cool spiders. Um, in general. And I like to think that they're great helpers for us because they actually do help control pest populations. So I mentioned before that you can find them in gardens and in parks. And that's actually a good thing because if you're out and about in your garden, you don't want flies flying all over you, biting you while you're trying to uh, water your garden or plant um, any, anything in your garden. So these guys will actually help control pests and they're actually to have around because they eat a lot of those insects that would more commonly bite us. So even though the shamrock spider may not be green, we are definitely very lucky to have them around. And Svetlana here, uh, although she's a little bit bigger than what you'd find in nature, these guys are pretty easy to recognize because of the striped pattern in their leg and that big bulbous, um, yeah, that big bulbous abdomen of theirs. So I encourage you all next time if you see a web or see a spider, to check it out, 
especially if you ever get the chance to watch a spider weaving its web, it's a really cool process. Spider webs are uh, one of nature's beauties. They're absolutely gorgeous, intricate structures. So definitely take the opportunity to go out and look for some webs today if you have nice weather. And at that, I'm gonna throw it back over to Michael and I think we're gonna take questions. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, we have one, one thing in between uh, questions and uh, yeah, one thing to do before questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here quickly. Shannon meant, talked a lot about how uh, spiders like Svetlana would create their web and do that daily. Uh, so our challenge for you all today is to create your own spider web. So maybe you can use some of the behaviors that, that orb weavers do uh, by making a, a, a line, that first guideline, and then one down uh, from it uh, to create that Y as your foundation or your frame for your, for your web. Um, but your, your challenge today, again, is to, to create your own spider web. And we have all the information about how to try that on our website at wildcenter.org backslash digital learning. Uh, so you would go to uh, digital learning, scroll on down, look for that familiar image of the spider all about arachnids, uh, click on that, scroll on down, and then our web weaver challenge is right here. You can pull it up on your computer or tablet and check it out while you try to do your, your web design, uh, or uh, go ahead and print it out and, and, and try out this process. One of our uh, interns tried it over the weekend and he reported back, it's pretty difficult. So we'll see if anybody can do it. If you do, uh, send us some pictures. Uh, we'd love to see your, your, your webs. I recommend using uh, found materials or something that has a space in it and is pretty solid uh, so that you're not pulling, if you have two sticks, you're not pulling them together uh, as you make the web. Uh, but give it a shot. Uh, it's a really, really fun activity. And if you'd like to learn more about ticks and other, other tick-borne diseases or, or uh, such as Lyme, um, the Adirondack Watershed Institute is a great resource uh, right up here uh, in the area that uh, has a, a lot of great information on their website about tick-borne diseases with Dr. Leanne Sporn that's been tracking uh, ticks and their populations throughout the North Country for, for many years now. So that said, uh, we're going to turn it uh, over to some questions. So if you have questions, whether you're in Zoom or Facebook, if you're on Zoom, uh, go ahead, throw those in the Q&A. If you're on Facebook, you can write them right in the chat and then we'll have uh, someone report them to us. And if you like invertebrates as much as we do, uh, we have another invertebrate themed digital drop in on Thursday at 11, where we'll be talking about some other really interesting, some of our favorite uh, invertebrates and their life cycles here uh, in the Adirondacks. So with that, I'll stop sharing and we'll see if we have some questions. All so right. there's one like question. Have... Oh, I think Shannon was about to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, it looks like we have a question from Terry, uh, and she says, spiders are great for gardens, but what can you do if you have arachnophobia? That is a great question. A lot of us do have what's known as arachnophobia or a fear of arachnids. And uh, it may not be a logical fear, um, but because they're so different than us in the way they move, the way they walk, um, sometimes our first reaction when we see a spider is to flee the scene or uh, run and hide or grab that newspaper or magazine and give it a whack. Um, and unfortunately, you don't actually want to do that. These guys are really, really small. So what I like to do is kind of logic through the puzzle. So most spiders are really small, um, about the size of one of your fingernails or less. So we are really big and scary to them. Um, so they really can't hurt us. Sure, spiders can bite us. It's pretty rare. Um, and even if they do, we'll have mild irritation. But the venom that they have is not enough to really harm us. So they really are non-threatening to us. And instead, they're helping keep us safe from those pests, as I explained earlier. So I always like to put it in perspective that spiders are pretty small and pretty helpful to us. So hopefully uh, you can try to work around that arachnophobia and maybe next time just we let that spider be. Um, or if you don't want it in your home, you can carefully collect it and put it outside. That would be fine too. But we don't want to be harming these guys because they're actually doing a service to our ecosystem. I, uh... I went through a similar process last night. I, I respect spiders and think that they're fascinating, but they do creep me out a little bit. 
I don't know if it's that they they sometimes are a little bit fuzzy or that they have lots and lots of eyes, uh, but for whatever reason, um, they, they scare me a little bit. Uh, so what I try to do is let that spider do what it's going to do. Uh, if there are spiders in my house, I'll move them to another location where I don't have to be right next to them. And as Shannon said, they're, they're doing a service for us. They're, they're removing any pests that could be in our home as well or, or out around our homes. And they're really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Looks like we have a question from Jenny. She says, do spiders, specifically shamrock spiders, reject some insects that land in their webs? Yes, they may. So as I've mentioned, some insects uh, pose a threat to the shamrock spider. If they're larger um, or have stingers that are still exposed, when the spider is going to um, inject them herself, she poses the, the risk of getting stung or bit. So she does have to decide um, if it's a risk, risk worth taking. Um, so she sometimes will reject certain insects and not choose um, to eat them and hope for something smaller to land in that web instead. Um, I think it, this depends more on the situation. Of course, um, if the stinger is faced away or she has access to the insect from another way, definitely she's going to eat anything that lands in her web because that is her way of life. But occasionally, yes, she will reject prey. There is another question. Are we going to talk about scorpions today? Yes, the so scorpions are an arachnid, but we do not have them here in the Adirondacks. Uh, so we decided to focus on the most common arachnids here, which are ticks and spiders. So we're not going to talk too much about scorpions today. Um, so we had a question from Catherine about the largest spider in New York. Shanna, do you know that, that one? Um, I don't want to misspeak. I don't know exactly what the largest spider in New York is. I know we have some pretty large dock spiders um, that can get very large, but there may be a larger one. Um, I can look it up after this, but I'm not sure exactly the biggest. And then a couple questions about uh, why are spiders good for gardens and should we pay them and how much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks for the question, uh, Acadia, about why they're good for gardens. So it's mainly pest control. Um, so oftentimes pests, insects, flies um, that could harm your garden would get stuck in a spider's web. And therefore she's helping to keep your, your garden, your vegetables or whatever you may be growing um, a little bit safer. Of course, we do need some insects for, for pollination and other things like that. But um, oftentimes, if there's an abundance of insects in your gardens, it's not going to be a good thing. So spiders help to mitigate that problem. And then the other question was, what was it again, Michael? Oh, it was how much to, to pay spiders. For oh, how much to pay them? Yeah. Things. So spiders do have a pretty important ecological role in our ecosystem. So I know there's, there's models calculated by ecologists of how much ecosystem services different animals provide. Uh, and if we lost them, um, what would happen to our environment? Um, so I know right now with bees, that's of specific concern with their populations dwindling because they do provide us um, with a lot of monetary um, environmental services. So uh, for now, I like to, to repay the spiders by letting them live and letting them share my home. Awesome, thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, we are going to, I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight my video here and uh, send you all off. I hope you have a great day. Get outside, explore a little bit, look for some of your neighborhood spiders, uh, whether they're right in your home or out uh, around in the environment around it. And just uh, try, try your hand at creating a web and, and have some fun. So again, if you are interested, tune in on Thursday for more Adirondack invertebrates and have a wonderful day, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.